Our guest on The Rocket this week is in the business of challenging lazy consensus. Martin Durkin is a celebrated TV producer and director who's made many terrific films, including The Great Global Warming Swindle, which challenged the dominant narrative of climate change, Britain's trillion pound horror story about the UK's national debt. In 2016, Durkin's Brexit the movie supported the UK leaving the European Union. And in 2021's The Great American Race Game, he gave a provocative account of the politics of race in America and of the black Americans who are fighting back. A Geordie by birth, Martin Durkin is a libertarian, formerly connected to the now defunct Revolutionary Communist Party. He has been described as the scourge of the Greens and one of the environmentalists' favourite hate figures. In his terrific new film, Climate the Movie, Martin Durkin returns powerfully to what he regards as the scam of global warming. Why did you feel you had to make it? Well, because everyone's talking such a load of bollocks about climate and have been for so long. It's deeply frustrating if you think that it's all nonsense, the uh, climate thing, because, you know, if you're in polite society and you suggest that, A, you're considered a total demon for even suggesting that it's not true, and B, you always get this comeback of, oh, but, you know, the consensus, all the scientists say, everyone agrees. And so I wanted to make a film, really, that looked into the nature of the consensus as well as the science. Can you just tell us a bit about the pressures that you found that people, scientists are under to support what increasingly uh, looks like something that isn't based on the data? The frustrating thing for scientists, I mean, good, honest scientists in this area, is that you're not really allowed even to point to mainstream scientific data or observations. I mean, you're published in mainstream journals carried out by uh, uh, scientists from very respected universities and so on, even cited by the IPCC and all this sort of thing. You're simply not allowed to talk about the stuff that doesn't fit into the climate alarm narrative. And the pressure on them to shut up is extreme. And I think it sort of comes from two sources. One is a rather shallow financial one. This involves so much money, the climate industry now, on the academic side and, and, and elsewhere, that you're really deemed to be rocking the boat if you say that you, know, you don't think this is a problem. There are loads of uh, university departments that rely on money that's got you know, uh, the climate tag on it. Uh, there are a lot of individual scientists whose whole careers are built on this and whose funding depends on this. So you're actually threatening the livelihoods of a lot of people if you dare to challenge this. But in a broader way, it's also become, you know, very much a political thing. You know, if you're a, an academic, if you're, you know, one of the middle class intelligentsia, broadly speaking, in the media, in the public sector in some way, in the third sector, you know, that general worldview is pro-government. And it's become, being pro-government has become synonymous with buying into the climate crisis. And so if you say, you know, you think it's not true, then, oh my God, you know, you, you must vote Trump or, uh, you know, you must vote Brexit, or you, you're labelled, you know, you must like Nigel Farage. You're suddenly in that sort of demon camp. And so there are these pressures, and there's more institutional pressures too. I mean, you're not likely to get funding if you go against the climate alarm because so much funding is connected to this. You're likely not to get published. So it, there's, a, there's a kind of a huge deluge of crap sort of comes on your head if you dare to poke your head above the, the parapet here. I mean, we've got scientists in the film, as you know, who, are, who talk about it, you know, in effect, being career suicide if you're a university scientist and you come out strongly against this. Alison and I have both seen preview versions of the film, Martin, of course. Listeners won't have seen the film. It's literally just coming out now. Just tell us briefly the nature of the people who appear in the film and what they say that's so very different from what Planet Normal listeners will have heard on their televisions and radios many, many times over, over recent years? Well, we've tried to keep it to very respected and uh, highly qualified scientists talking about the, 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 the science because, you know, that, that's the usual comeback, oh, who says this? And so, for example, we've got Professor Stephen Coonan, who was a science advisor to President Obama, and he was both provost and Vice President of Caltech, which is one of the most respected you know, research institutes in the world. And he said, look, I'm just going to use the official data, the official observations to show that this just doesn't stack up. You know, and the, the idea that this is, A, that this is settled at all, but B, that is settled in the direction of there being a climate crisis is nonsense. There is no climate crisis. You know, even their 
data, you know, does, there has not been an increase in hurricane activity. There's not been an increase in droughts. There's not an increase in wildfires. You know, it's just all of this is just not true. And you can see just by looking at data. And listeners can, by the way. I mean, you, I, I'd recommend there are some great sites. There's one called No Tricks Zone, tricks as in car tricks. And it was stacks and stacks of science papers on there that disagree with the, the climate crisis, often written by people who don't themselves disagree. But nevertheless, the data disagrees with the climate crisis thing. We've got Professor Will Happer. He was, um, he's been science advisor to uh, three presidents or four, I can't remember. And he was professor of physics. At, now it's Princeton. I can't remember what it was before, but he's you know, one of the great physicists of his generation. We've got John Clauser, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2022. We've got Professor Nir Shaviv, who is a brilliant physicist, young physicist from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who had been at Caltech before then, and they're dying to make you know, dean of science over there. I mean, he's a, you know, an enormous bright guy. We've got Professor Henrik Svensmark, who is a great physicist from Denmark. And we've got Roy Spencer, who's one of the biggest names, one of the guys who invented the weather satellite system, you know, works at and with NASA to develop that, which, you know, results from pretty much the uh, uh, the satellite observations are directly at odds with most of the nonsense that's talked about climate. I mean, I could go on, but the list is terribly impressive. And there are all sorts of impressive people we weren't able to get in, uh, but uh, are, you know, very sound people. You know, they're not flat earthers. That's the thing. If you hear Al Gore, you know, you'll say, oh, these guys are just flat earthers. These people are enormously respected scientists. And the, the thing that gets me, if you watch any of these ghastly BBC programs about climate, they don't back anything up. There'll be this bland assertion, oh, yeah, we're changing the climate. Oh, we're changing the earth, all this sort of Where's the science to back this up? Where is the science to support these contentions? You know, it's not difficult. Viewers can do it. Get on the internet, read up what Earth's temperature is today compared to the last 500 million years. Look up where CO2 levels are compared to the last 500 million years. I mean, you know, don't take my word for it. Don't take the word of you know, all the wonderful uh, academics I have in my film. Go read for yourself. I absolutely loved uh, Professor Will Happer, Martin, and the way he speaks. He could walk straight out of a John Updike or indeed a John Cheever short story. And he said, there's this mischievous idea that scientific truth is determined by consensus. And, and I suppose that brought me on to thinking about how we pride ourselves on living in a rational age. And yet we seem to be prone, as for millennia, really, or certainly through the centuries, to these spasms of madness. And we could point in recent times, of course, to the COVID madness in which something called the science was used to bludgeon everybody into obedience. Having steeped yourself in this, where did this particular madness arise? And has it been kept going because it is a kind of a great money spinner? I think it's it's not a sporadic madness. I think it's a systematic madness. And I think there is a, luckily because of COVID, there's much greater cynicism developing about the what experts say. I think there was, and the same is true of Brexit as well, all the experts lined up and said, well, you know, if you vote for Brexit, the next day the economy will collapse. You know, and the experts say that and they, they challenge, go, who are you to challenge the experts? Likewise, in COVID, you know, we were, the experts came out with all sorts of cods, which you know, turned out not to be true. And so I think that there is happily a growing cynicism about what so-called experts say. And the difficulty is that the experts that we're talking about are part of the publicly funded establishment. You know, they, there, is a, there is a class of experts whose interests lie with there being a big government whose livelihoods depend on government spending and on, on whose jobs are you know, defined and justified by government regulation. So they have a specific class interest. They believe in big government because their livelihoods depend on it. And that's how they view the world. And that's you know, what, what they tend to uh, promote. And so, for example, in, even Liam with, knows with economics, the number of experts who will say, oh, yeah, it's fine printing money. It's great. You know, don't worry about it. It'll, it's it's going to be OK. Or they say, you know, large amounts of debt. That's fine. We can cope with it. It's not a problem. Huge taxation. Nah, that's fine. You know, the government will spend money, your money for you, and it will you know, generate growth. All sorts of nonsense is kind of spouted by so-called experts who are, in fact, really just reflecting their own particular class interests. And so I think that doing this has really solidified in my mind the view that uh, you know this is 
I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, we're kind of engaged in a class war, I think. And one half of that class war is the publicly funded establishment and their fellow travellers. Tell us how you think that debate on climate change is shifting, Martin. The Tory government pushed back the date at which it's illegal, illegal to make cars with internal combustion engines from 2030 to 2035 to where it was the EU average. You're getting a sense now that there's a bit of realism coming into the debate about climate change. Why do you think that's happening? Well, I think they're coming to the limits of what's possible, because if, if there are blackouts, and if uh, you know the, the economy collapses, then really they, they you know they can't do that that's a that's a brick wall for them. So they've got to rein back a little bit to stop that happening. But I can't see very much that there's a there's a shift in the kind of ideology. I, I think we imagine that we live in a democracy, but every political party buys into the green agenda. If you think that it's all codswallop, and you know that, that, that the whole renewables malarkey is is just going to wreck manufacturing and so on and so forth and and you don't agree that you know there should be low traffic neighborhoods and whatever who are you going to vote for the tories buy into it labor buys into it everyone buys into it there is a a sense in which no matter what and it's a bit the same with economics you know if you think that the state you know should you know taxation should be you know 10 percent flat rate the state should spend an awful lot less the state should be a lot less but who do you vote for this is a stitch up there is no offer on the ballot paper that says we're just going to scrap the green agenda. So although they're reining back a little bit and saying, oh, we'll delay, we'll, you know, they still say we're going for net zero. This nonsense phrase, I mean, as if we could survive with, you know, not, not producing any carbon dioxide. I'm not sure there's a shift in the debate there. I think there's a shift in the debate among ordinary people. I think there's a, a much, much greater degree of cynicism there. But how that's going to manifest itself, I don't know, because you see the emergence of alternative political movements, uh, you know, reform or uh, uh, other things in other countries, you know, support for Trump. You know, an awful lot of people who support Trump don't particularly like Trump, but they really hate the people who hate Trump. And they regard that as an anti-establishment gesture. And I think that that's going to start happening in other countries too. We have had a sort of warning signal this week. Germany is clearly not going to hit its uh, electric vehicles target. So I'd, in answer to your question, I think that realism is going to give them a bloody nose. In the end, if they can't make money out of some of these things, then it's going to really hit them. But coming back, Martin, to that very interesting point you made about class, I mean, one of the things that comes out from Climate the Movie is what I would describe as a Puritan finger-wagging hair shirt element, particularly from these middle-class protesters. You know, you vulgar people are enjoying yourself a bit much with your cheap foreign holidays and your white vans. Do you think there's an element of snobbery, almost, in fact, misanthropy, which underpins the climate debate? I think there's a really strong element of that. I mean, I've read, because I've done films before on the environmental movement, I've read lots and lots of environmental stuff. And the thing that finally the penny dropped a few years back, that you could be both anti-capitalist and anti-working class. And in fact, that's what we're seeing. Because how come Prince Charles is anti-capitalist? He buys into the green thing. You know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, the IMF, they all buy into this thing. We strangely have an anti-capitalist establishment. Yeah, the establishment loves taxation because it feeds off it. It loves regulation because, you know, that's its, that's its little empire. So oddly enough, this myth that in a capitalist society, the establishment must be capitalist and pro-capitalist, not true. We have an anti-capitalist establishment and also anti-capitalist politics are quite posh. I mean, back in, you know, I, I, I put on a funny accent now, but actually I come from the Northeast, I was Geordie. And, I, and where, you know, when I've had a bit of drink, I started to talk with Geordie again. But back in the North, you know, the kind of working class side of my extended family were the ones who voted Brexit, the ones that voted UKIP, or the ones that actually are quite pro-capitalist. It's the posh element who went to university that are quite left-wing. You know, there is the green anti-capitalism is terribly snobby. You know, if you read their thing, they say the world is consuming too much and they loathe mass production and mass consumption. Oh, my God, we're all consuming far. They don't mean they're consuming too much. And the form of consumption they hate 
or they hate the IKEA, they hate McDonald's, they hate all, you know, Walmart, Walmart. What they don't hate is, you know, the really posh cheese shops in Highbury and uh, uh, posh vintners and the places where they get the Persian rugs from and the place where they get the nice Italian floor tiles and things like that. You know, their consumption is fine. It's the consumption of the, the, the vulgar masses. You know, I think Earth First organized a puking in a shopping mall. How disgusting shopping malls are, you know, ordinary people. There is a huge element of snobbery in green anti-capitalism. Capitalism, the problem with capitalism, they think, is that it has actually enriched the masses, not that it's impoverished them. That's the weird thing. Martin, I can't stress enough to Planet Normal listeners what a serious and well-regarded filmmaker you are. Even with your often heretical views, your films have been broadcast on Channel 4. You've made extremely well-received films on subjects, including the history of racial relations in America, a film on Britain's massive national debt. The one critique I've had of your film is that I felt you set up too false a dichotomy here. It's either we go completely net zero 2050 or we go to fossil fuels. I think there's a much more nuanced position here. I want to see us using less fossil fuels. I want to see us use more hydrogen. As somebody who is more than willing to have a conversation with you about the net zero industry and how it's deceiving people in many ways and lying in its own pockets, I want to see us going to fuel sources like hydrogen. I want to see us achieving the battery storage technology that allows us to re use renewables. Do you think there's something in that? I think in terms of energy, I don't know about energy. I don't know about batteries. I don't know about hydrogen. I don't know about fossil fuels. I'd rather let the market decide. You know, if, they, if it's cheaper to do one kind of energy generation, that's fine. If it's cheaper to do batteries and better to do batteries, that's fine as well. It's not that I hate electric cars. It's just that I think that the thing that should determine whether we have electric cars is the normal interplay of industry, the energy industry, manufacturing, and ordinary consumers. And I, you know, when, whenever planners have become involved, it's, they're usually motivated by things you know, that aren't necessarily rational, but by other prejudices. The fact is that you know, industrial society, which they sort of like to have a whack at, you know, we have the cleanest society in the world. You know, if you want the cleanest air, the cleanest rivers, generally, the clean, you go to the most capitalist countries. The dirtiest countries are the socialist countries and the pre-industrial countries or the barely industrial countries. That's where the disgusting pollution is. That's where the short lifespans are. So um, I, I have a great faith in the market and just basic regulation about not doing, you know, polluting rivers and that sort of thing. But otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to let the market decide energy policy. I mean, there shouldn't be energy policy. Really. There should be an energy market. Your film will have powerful forces arrayed against it, Martin. Do you foresee attacks on you? And finally, how do you think this spell, the very powerful spell, now be broken? Yeah, I'm sure I'll be attacked. Um, my, my, my Mrs. Kate begged me not to make the film because there'd be, you know, goodness knows what repercussions. You know, I made one in 2007, the great global warming swindle, and, you know, it was like the, the, the roof fell on our head. And half the people who worked on the film are nervous about having their names attached, even though they've been very happy to work on the film. And, uh, you know, sort of, I've got a few changed names in the credits. And we were worried about whether we could get it into a cinema, whether a cinema would accept it. It was invitation only, the premiere, because we didn't want to advertise it widely because we thought we'd be shut down. The Spectator and The Telegraph are all very nervous about actually coming out fighting against this. Everyone's terribly timorous. But I think that's why it's so important to come out. We should really worry that the climate alarmists have such a monopoly of public discourse on this, that we have such a, an enormously powerful publicly funded establishment that is able to control directly or indirectly what we hear and what we read and what we're taught, what is okay to think and what's not okay to think. That in itself should worry us enormously. It was 17 years ago since I did the great global warming swindle and there hasn't been a single big documentary criticizing the climate alarm since then. That's terrifying that there is such a stitch up on this issue. You know, it is really worrying. I'm expecting to get uh, kicked, but in a sense, the fact that I'm getting kicked made it all the more important to make the film, if you know what I mean. And in terms of what's going to be done, I think the only way this is going to be overturned is by people who are in the working class and the commercial middle class saying, you know, we've had enough of low traffic neighborhoods, of being told, you know, where we're going to put our rubbish and all that sort of thing. There's going to be, a, I can't, there'll have to be 
a sort of revolution from below because it's certainly not come, going to come from the you know effete middle class intelligentsia who who are really promoting this. Martin Durkin, thanks so much for joining us on Planet Normal. Thanks so much for having me. Well, Alison, Climate the Movie, The Cold Truth. And Martin tells us it will be released on March the 21st, so not long. And it's free online if Planet Normal listeners, if they want to watch it, if they search for Climate the Movie on their laptops or their computers, they'll be able to find it. And as Martin says, watch it for free. It's a really terrific piece of work, I think. And and it's really chiming now, Liam, isn't it, with what we're seeing this week is not exactly a climb down, but just a sort of moderation of the net zero position, which it turns out, surprise, surprise, is increasingly untenable when faced with reality. So we've actually had Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg just calling in fact for the net zero 2050 target to be abandoned altogether. And that may be something we hear more about in the run-up to the election. But Lee, we had this very interesting announcement from the Energy Secretary, Claire Catino, this week, didn't we, about building more gas-fired power stations? It is very interesting. So the UK currently relies on gas-fired power stations for about 40% of its electricity and renewables on some days are up at 40% too. Coal, by the way, has gone from about a third of our electricity as recently as the turn of the century to 1% or 2% now. That's an astonishing reduction by the UK. The point I'd make is that the more renewables we have before we've actually found out a way to store renewable energy, the more we need gas-fired power stations in order to fill the gaps when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And that happens quite a lot in the UK, particularly in winter when we need more energy. And this is one reason, Martin didn't get into this in his film, but this is one reason why electricity is so expensive in the UK, because we need all these gas-fired power stations on standby, waiting for when renewables can't deliver on a certain day. And so the cost of having those gas-fired power stations just standing there, manned, maintained, ready to be literally fired up, that is spread across all of our energy complex, which is why electricity in the UK is so much more expensive than the EU average, both for commercial and domestic users. I agree with you. I've made plenty of documentaries myself, and it is always a huge effort to get a really high-fiber, research-heavy documentary made. And Martin's done it in a way. It's explained beautifully. It's very cleverly scripted. My concern with it, or my one quibble with it, isn't the evidence he provides at the top, which is unanswerably interesting and absolutely should be watched by everybody, the caliber of the people he gets on his film, as we said during the interview. My quibble, as as I outlined to him, and we didn't have too long to talk about it, is that he says he seems to present the only alternative to you know the big net zero 2050 green agenda is to go back to using lots more oil and gas and maybe coal. I don't agree with that. In the medium term, I think we can use more renewables and that would be a better way to go. The danger comes from trying to do it so quickly and all the virtue signaling and class war that's associated with it. It is technology that will solve the problem of us polluting the atmosphere in order to heat our homes and drive our cars. I personally think hydrogen is going to be a very, very important fuel in that regard. And I also think nuclear is going to play a very important role in that regard, as indeed Martin and I and you discussed. But yeah, he will get brickbats thrown at him. He should absolutely plow on as he will. He's a very determined bloke and a very smart bloke. And his film deserves a wide audience and people who believe in free speech and proper debate should actually watch the film before they start slagging it off. It's deeply shocking, Liam, because what he's talking about is some of the most eminent physicists in the world. I mean, literally the winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics 2020, talking about not just a conspiracy of silence, but actual bullying of academics. No academic who's starting out their career or trying to climb up the ladder can possibly address the fact that the data doesn't support that there's a climate crisis. I mean, it's just a completely mad emperor's new clothes. And I think it's just profoundly disturbing that this is throughout the developed world. These are deeply serious things. 